so thank you, Lord, for uh, for uh, everything, and welcome everybody on on Facebook and, and YouTube and everything. And, uh, we have a quick testimony, and we'll get on with the word. Good question. Seems so weird in here today, but anyway, um, as you guys know, um, our daughter lives with us with our grandson, and I have been with this baby from the moment he was born. Uh -oh. I mean, literally from the moment he was born through all the pregnancy. And all the difficulties she had in her pregnancy, which went through her, with her through the four days of delivery, and then she had complications in the beginning and couldn't even hold him when he was first born, and so on and so forth. So I really got a bond with this child. Well, they left to go to Florida for about 10 days on Thursday, and I'm telling you, I mean, I sound a little choked up now. I was bawling like a baby. In fact, I told them, just leave because I'm not going to stop crying. And so every day I was having this issue and I was reaching out to different people saying, pray for me, pray for me, pray for me. I'm really struggling with this. Well, yesterday, a dear friend of ours who is also one of our intercessors got back to me and she said, Kathy, she said, you need to understand that what you're going through is real. It's called separation anxiety. And she listed all kinds of scriptures and gave me all kinds of encouragement. But basically what I wanna to get to is this. She said to me, I can pray for you and I will, but you need to do the work. You need to go to God and ask him to take this away from you and to repent for, for falling into what you have fallen into. So I just wanted to give a word of encouragement because you know, so many times we're going through things and we stop, we, we, we don't, don't remember that the enemy's on the attack. And when we're doing the work of the ministry, he's attacking even more. You know, I don't, I'm not going to get into this whole higher level, higher devil thing, because that is one devil, he's the same, but the more you do, the more he's going to come after you, and the harder he's going to attack you. So we need to remember the power and authority that God has given us as believers, and walk in it, and declare it. And so when we're struggling, the first thing we should be doing is going to God ourselves and saying, Lord, this is what I'm going through, this is what I'm facing, I need your help. And, and, and find out how he's leading you and guiding you to take care of that issue. And don't be afraid to ask people to pray for you as well. So, there you have it. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Praise God. Because uh, I woke up this morning and I, and I didn't have, I didn't cry over Carter. I even got to look at his picture and smile and laugh. And so, to me, you got to understand for me that's huge because I, like every time I seen his picture, I would just get teary eyes, like oh my god. So, so it really, uh, it just God works. He's for us. He's not against us. Yeah. He's for us, not against us. So. Praise God, right? Praise God. Wow. Hey, you guys ready for for a word today? Um, we're having technical difficulties, so. Today we're going to just talk about uh, going going still on a, uh, the theme of our redemption. We're going to talk about uh, what Jesus gave us in the resurrection. Because in His resurrection, He actually gave us stuff. Uh, a lot of people, you know, don't always know and think that that there's any anything given. But a lot was given, and we're going to just touch on a few of the things, of the many things that today that He has given us. So. Today, our foundational scriptures are Ephesians 2, 10 through 13. Lord, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for, for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you are continuously growing us and bringing us closer and closer to you and continuously making it so that we can continue to grow. You said... That you're, you'll finish the work that you started in us. And we thank you for finishing this work in Jesus' name. All right. So the first thing we have.
have to talk about is, is in, in the resurrection when Jesus rose from the dead, he allowed us to be in him. And in, in, in Christianity, we've heard that a hundred times. You're in Christ, you're, you're with Christ. We, we actually, I mean, the question, well, how are we in Christ? Okay. Because even though the scripture says we're in Christ, how do you be there? How, do you, how, do you, how are, you, are, are you actually in Christ? In the resurrection, we are able to enter into Christ through our spirit. So, physically, everybody's here in, in, in the church, in Cornerstone Community Fellowship right now, right? Uh -huh. Physically, right? But spiritually, we're all in Christ as part of who he is. So, our life source should be who? Christ. But how many let the world be the life source? How many of us sit there and you get a little fleshy? I know none of you guys do. You're really good at it. But we all tend to be there. We all tend to get a little fleshy. Because we fail in that moment to have our life source be Jesus. Our life source changes to something else. But to be in Jesus means that our life source is him. Spiritually, that is who he is. Okay? Let's open our Bibles this morning. Let's go to Colossians. And we're going to go to, to chapter 1, verse 12. And that's where we're going to start. We're going to go through uh, quite a bit of scripture today. So uh, I can make a couple points here. 112. Colossians 112. Everybody there? It says in, in 112, it says, Paul says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to, to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. In the light. We, when you believe the gospel of salvation, you became the praise, listen to it, praise of his glory. We became, when we gave our lives to Jesus, we became the praise of his glory. So he's praising us in his glory. Does it make sense? It's important to understand our position because if we don't understand that he is, he is the one that is or that we became the praise of his glory. In other words, we are his praise. We praise him, but we are his praise with his glory. We became this by the fact that we are partakers of this inheritance. Part of the inheritance is being in his glory. All right? Let's keep going. We became in our ho and are holy and without blame in him before God. Ephesians, let's go to, you're in Colossians. Uh, leave your finger right there in Colossians and let's flip over to Ephesians real quick. Let's look at a couple things here. Ephesians, Ephesians. Ephesians uh, 1, uh, 1 to 4. I'm going to set, set some foundation here. It says this. It says, Jesus, just as he cho chose us in him, notice what he said, what he, Paul said. He chose us in him. So he chose to put us in him already. Before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So as long as we are chosen and we are in him, we are blameless before him. Now we have to separate the two hymns. Okay? The first one is in Jesus. We're in Jesus because we're chosen at the foundations of the earth to be in Jesus. And we're pure in front of God. Does this make sense? 
spent cents. Mm -hmm. I know it's a little, a little bit it's tough this early in the morning, but we'll get there. All right, let's, uh, let's go over to Philippians 2, uh, verse 15. Paul had some revelation here that he laid out about us being in Christ so deeply that we're actually unable, no one's able to pull us out from Christ. Philippians uh, 2.15, it says this, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. How many are shining as lights every day to the world? This is where we're we're put in this little crook, okay? We're 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 actually harmless. All right, you still got your finger in, in Colossians there? Go to uh, verse verse twenty two, chapter one, verse twenty two. Again, it says, "In the body of his flesh through death, to the present." To present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight, God's sight. Actually, let's go, go to uh, verse 21. We'll, we'll read them together. And you who once were alienated and enemies in your, your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death. You see where our reconciliation is. To present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. We're completely blameless without, report, without reproach in God's sight as long as we are in Christ. And that in, in Christ doesn't necessarily mean that you're, well, I, I'm, I'm a believer. In Christ means that we actually love Christ. And how do we love Christ? We obey him. I think it's pretty clear in, in John 5, 5, 14 and 15. We obey him. That's how we know we're in Christ. All right, let's turn to 2 Corinthians uh, 5, chapter 5. And we're going to go to verse 17. 5, 17. All right, everybody there? It says this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. What things became new? All things. It's interesting he says all things, because everybody says, well, well spiritually we're, we've been reborn. Paul didn't say that, did he? He said all things. That means our mind was renewed, our spirit was renewed, and our body, which should be doing actions of Christ, is renewed. Sure. Sure, Pastor, go ahead. Therefore, Therefore, if any person is engrafted in Christ, the Messiah, he is a new creation, a new creature altogether. The old, previous moral and spiritual condition has passed away. Behold, the fresh and new has come. See, that's where so much teaching has really held Christians captive. Because when it when I came back to the Lord, that scripture was, oh, that's just your spirit. Doesn't say that. It says everything. Mm -hmm. Everything's made new. It's interesting, huh? I like that we're engrafted in we're, Christ. Right, we're engrafted in Christ. How, how, now, let's go back to last, last week's teaching. No. 
last week, week before. Okay, we talked about being grafted in. And what was the key to being grafted in? Abiding in him. And the key to abiding in him is obeying him. How many of these people can, that work can obey their boss if they're not talking with their boss? If you don't talk with your boss, there's no way you can obey them. There has to be a conversation between the boss and you at work so that you know what the boss requires of you, right? Mm -hmm. So you can obey. That's the same thing with, with Christ. We know the, the four commandments, right? Mm -hmm. You know, love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, love your neighbor as yourself, right? Preach the gospel, make disciples, and love the brethren. But really, the only, if you do those four commandments, you have fulfilled everything within the Bible of what God tells us to do. Those four commandments, that's it. But sometimes there's other things that we don't listen to when Holy Spirit tells us to do something and we just kind of ignore it. Who's been there? Right? Is that still obeying Christ? No. Because a lot of times those, those little warnings or nudges or whatever you call them, they are usually you know, trying to protect you mm -hmm. or prepare you for there's something coming up right. or telling you that, okay, this is, this is what I need you to do to prepare for you to do. But if you're not prepared to do, how many know if you're not prepared to do something, you ain't going to get it done? You see, it's the same concept. If we want to stay in Christ, We have to obey. We have to do what he says. Okay? So where do we leave off? Verse 7. We only got the first verse of 17. So praise God. So we're going to be grafted in. And all things are made new. How many have a resurrected, resurrected body? Okay, good. I'm talking to the right people. Because our body is the last thing to be renewed. Our body in the resurrection, when Christ returns with our trumpet, just so you know, I'll just dis dispel all the myths and, and everything. God, when he comes, when Jesus comes back, the world will know. There will be trumpets sounding. All the angels in the world are going to be trumpeting in Jesus' return. So the people that don't believe, they will know Jesus is here. And then our bodies will be taken up and we'll have resurrected bodies and won't that be nice oh, oh yeah i won't have to exercise to get rid of my belly no more how's that mm -hmm. okay so it'd be resurrected <laughs> right there'll be no pain and sickness and anything else in us but at this present moment what's at this present moment is great at the present moment we have some very simple things. Our spirit has been renewed. Our mind has been renewed. However, Paul also says that you we need to renew our mind. So it's renewed because it's been reborn. Well, how many know that we have strongholds? And, and, and how many know that the strongholds that we have are between our ears and not in our spirit? Right. Okay? No strongholds are where then? In our mind. So that the renewing of our mind is what Paul's talking about. Getting rid of those strongholds. Though they're already gone in Christ, Satan keeps them in our mind so that we don't have any control over the actual outcome of that until those strongholds are gone. <laughs> Okay, let's go to verse 18. Verse 18 says, Now all things are of God who has, I'm sorry, now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. 
you hear what, what ministry we have? Every that, There's your purpose, everybody, in life. You have a ministry of reconciliation. Bringing other individuals to the reconciliation knowledge of Christ. Yes, you want to read that in the Amplified? No. Okay, so in the Amplified it says, but all things are from God who through Jesus Christ reconciled us to himself, received us into favor, brought us into harmony with himself, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that by word and deed we might aim to bring others into harmony with him. So it's by the things that we do and the things that we say that draw people in right. to him. Exactly, the love of God brings man to repentance yelling at them, telling them that they're sinners, they already know they're sinners. They don't, need, they don't need any man to tell them, or woman to tell them that they're sinner. They already know it. It's the love of God that brings man to repentance. All right. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore, implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin, sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Again, it's the righteousness of God in him. We have to be in Christ to become his, the righteousness of God. All right? All right. So that I got a little footnote here. You don't have to turn there. I'm just going to read them to you. Isaiah, you might be taking notes, write them down. Isaiah 53, 6. I'm going to read it in the Amplified Classic. Just kind of put some more meat to this. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has made to light upon him the guilt and iniquity of us all. You hear how Isaiah said that? God put the iniquity and guilt on Jesus our iniquity and guilt. Verse 9 uh, in the same same chapter. And they assigned him a grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Jesus didn't really, I mean, Jesus was the perfect man. He did nothing violent. Human turned over to Satan. There was no deceit in his mouth. Everything he spoke was true and complete. But what did Satan see? See, Satan saw Jesus becoming death, becoming obedient to death. Satan saw him as a man. Satan said, in his mind, and I don't really know because I've never been in his mind, he's only 10 people. But I think he was thinking, I finally got him. I finally got him. He's a man and he's going to hell. I think he can catch him. I really do. Satan, Satan, and this is something that we have to understand, on the cross, at the moment Jesus died, Satan actually conquered Jesus. And he took his spirit to the dark regions of hell. How do we know that? If Jesus had all the sin and iniquity of the world placed on him, there's only one place he could go. He had to go to hell by God's own word. So Satan said, yes, I won. And that's all he's seen. All that he's seen. Jesus, whom God had made to be sin, was justified in the spirit and raised to a new life by God. Jesus was born into the new covenant in the pit of hell. In the pit of hell, and then conquered Satan in that pit. How do we know? 
Go back to Colossians real quick. Colossians 2.15. Actually, we'll go to 14. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Everybody know what, what, um, what it means to make a, a spectacle? Embarrassment. All right. So, so back back when the Roman Empire was around, if they conquered a king, okay, or a kingdom, they would take the leaders of that and parade them around in front of everybody, proving that they were now captive and they had no power. That's what he's talking about. Okay. Jesus made a spectacle of them braided them around in, in everything of that. Okay? Alright. Now in him we have redemption. You're still in Colossians, right? Go, go, just just uh, go back to chapter 1. Uh, verse 14. That's right. In whom we have redemption through his blood for the forgiveness of sin. So our redemption is in Christ in what he did on the cross. All right? All right. I know some of this is a, is good review, but I think that we need to get a better understanding of it. All right, let's go to John 17. And it's uh, verse 15. John 17, 15. And it is the um, John 17 is the longest recorded prayer of Jesus. Imagine that. You guys, you guys like how I like long prayers, right? I like the simple prayers, the little prayers. I don't do very long ones. Everybody at John 15 or John 17, 15 says this, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. All right. Right there we know Jesus does not want any of us to die. So when somebody says, you know, God took this person, they are not reading scripture. That's right. Because Jesus prayed that God take none of us out of this world. Just protect us from the evil one. All right. So they don't die because of God, they die because of Satan. They are not of this world, just as I'm not of this world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So where do we hear God's word? We hear the truth. We hear it in the Bible. But where else? Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit speaks to us, that is God's word. So that's why you can't just say, well, I know the Bible and I'm good. Because Holy Spirit will speak other things. The Holy, Holy Spirit and the Bible are equal in authority. I know that doesn't sound right, but they are. The Bible and Holy Spirit, when, it, when Holy Spirit speaks to you and when the Bible speaks to you, that is the exact same authority. It's still God. We have to look at it that way. So as we hear Holy Spirit, either through the Word, the Bible, or through our spirit, it's the same authority. All right, let's keep going. Uh, as, as you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So that, that includes us then, right? Mm -hmm. We 
because we're, we believe through the apostles' word. That they may all be, I'm sorry, that they may be one as you, Father, are one, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. Okay. Uh, that's not so fascinating to me. <laughs> I'm sorry. It looks so like, oh. All right. Let's, let's just read that slowly. Yeah. That verse. Ready? And the glory which you gave me, God gave Jesus glory, right? When did Jesus get the glory of God? When he died and was resurrected. Yeah. He was filled with the glory of God. But Jesus already knew that he had the glory of God because he was with God before the foundations of the earth. Right? right? So, listen to what he's saying. The glory which you, God, gave me, Jesus, I have given who? All the apostles and, and those that believe in him through their word. Mm -hmm. So whose glory should you be walking in? Jesus. God's glory. God's glory. Because God gave glory to Jesus, and here Jesus prayed that he gave that glory to you. That's powerful. How many of us even can keep the concept that we're walking in God's glory? That's powerful. That's, a, that's one of those, let's meditate on that for a month. Put that on the scripture, you know, a little piece of paper everywhere out, throughout your house and on your steering wheel while you're driving and at your computer at work. And just meditate on that for about a month. Think that change your world? Mm -hmm. That's what Paul's talking about, renewing your mind. He's not saying memorize the Bible. He's saying meditate on the word. Remember in, in uh, I think in Joshua, says to meditate on the word? Day and night. Day and night. Yeah. He didn't say memorize it, but meditate. There is a difference. There's a big difference. Now, through meditation of his word, you will memorize it. But it's just not memorization to memorize. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, in modern Christianity, people teach you to memorize to memorize instead of meditate on it and get it part of in, imparted into your heart. All right. All right, last verse here. I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one. And that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. See, it all goes together, these two. He's glorifying us, giving us the glory that God gave him, and he's bringing us into one with him to be perfect in front of Christ, or in front of God, so that the world knows that we are loved by God. How many of us walk around in our actions, in our speaking, that tells the world that we're loved by God? It's a powerful place to be. All right. Let's go over Romans 3. And verse 21. Romans 3, 21. So that basically means that when you're going through something and you're down and you're out, the world shouldn't be able to look at you and know that you're going through it. Exactly. They sh you should be able to rise above the situation because God has called us to be overcomers. And listen, I'm not saying that I got this down and that I'm perfect. I just shared with you this morning my testimony. Um, we all go through it, but it's learning that he's given us the ability to go through it. Right. And to go through the Okay. Um, that was great at Rome.
Romans 3, 3.21, and it says this. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Let's just stop right there for a second. That last, verse 23, is used by many Christians to justify their sin. Well, you know, all fallen short of the glory of God. That's just my little sin. But if you read verse 24... It no longer is a sin issue. It is now an issue of you choosing to sin. Because it says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a, as a preparation or mercy seat by his blood through faith, to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. To demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just in the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So we're justified if we have faith in Jesus. So just because we fall short of the glory of God, or as Paul is saying, all of us have, because we are have faith in Jesus and we gave our life to the Lord, guess what? We no longer fall short. It's literally what he's saying. How dare us use that? Well, everybody's falling short of the glory of God. Well, if you give your life to Christ, you ain't falling short of the glory of God, because you we just read in verse 17 of John, Jesus gave us the glory that God gave him. Right? If you keep reading, you go into Corinthians, I think it's in Corinthians, Paul tells us that the reason we sin is, sin is because we choose to sin. Not that sin's in us anymore. All right. Where is the boasting then? It is excluded. Mm. But what law of works no or by what law of works no by the law of faith therefore we conclude that the man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law our redemption is for spirit from spiritual death and sin we are no longer slaves to the sin but free and alive in Christ we're free from sickness and disease pot and poverty poverty. <laughs> All right. Redemption to God is to, is to God. In Revelation, you know, uh, you know I wasn't, wasn't going to go there. Let's go to Revelation. Since we're going to be doing this study. Revelation 5. Um, and verse 9. 5, 9. sang a new song saying you are worthy to take the scrolls and to open up its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us to, the, to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and you have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth Did you notice what it says we're not going to reign in heaven we're going to reign on earth kingdom. When Jesus returns, we will still be on earth. We won't go through all the troubles because we'll be caught up in a in witness in the cloud of witnesses. And God will get rid of all the evil and then we're going to be set back down here on earth. 
to a glorified body, a resurrected body, and living in the kingdom of God on earth. The very heart of for Jesus, Jesus' death and our redemption was for our fellowship with God. That's the only reason God decided on a solution of Jesus. The salvation wasn't really for us. Our salvation isn't for us. So it may, it's weird, isn't it? You mean to tell me my salvation is not for me? It wasn't. It was so God could have a relationship with you. So God could fellowship with you. How do we know that? If we went to if we went to Genesis or not Genesis, Exodus, okay? And I think it is I think it's chapter thirty four, but I can be wrong on that. Okay. God told the Israelites, right? So I told Moses, get the Israelites over to the, the base of Mount Sinai. Okay? And God was going to speak directly to the Israelites at Mount Sinai. Can you imagine being in a position like that and just, you know, as a, I mean, there's millions of people there. And all of a sudden, God's going to speak to you. That's pretty powerful, huh? All right? So, here we have Mount Sinai. God wants to speak to the people directly. Directly to them. What would the people say? No. We may die if we hear God's voice. You go, Moses, and get Aaron and Levi here. So even then, in the Old Testament, when man was evil, evil, right? Not that man's not any e less evil, evil now. All right. God wanted a relationship with the, his people. He wanted to be able to talk to them directly. So our salvation isn't for us, is it? Our salvation was for, for God to have fellowship with us. Interesting, huh? We, I mean, we don't think of it that way, but it, that's really not what it is for. For him to have fellowship with us. Because he created us. How, how many of us have kids or, or uh, you know, when you have a kid, you always want fellowship with that, that child. You don't want that child to just disappear and never talk to you. You want some sort of fellowship with them. Your mom, your dad, you know, you want to have some kind of fellowship with them. Even if you don't have fellowship with them, in your heart you still want it because that's who you're from. Who are we from? God. We came out of God. So wouldn't it be natural that we would naturally want fellowship with, with a God? Or with God, right? Okay? All right. Now, let's get into what our inheritance is. It's kind of where I wanted to go. It took a little longer to get here than I wanted, but that's okay. Somebody needed to hear that, and that, that's the great, greatness of God, all right? An inheritance, we all know, an inheritance usually is, is received after the death of somebody who actually is the, what they call the, the testator, okay? Like my dad. Dad died, and we, we got our inheritance. Okay. Bless you. Bless you. Uh, let's go. Let's start with Ephesians one. Read this, and we're going to look at Ephesians one. That in the di in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. 
In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. That we who first trusted in Christ should be, be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with Holy Spirit of promise. So we're sealed, which is really great. There's no, no taking that away from us. Okay? But we were predestined for this inheritance. Alright. Let me read to you. You don't have to go there. But just, I'm going to read to you. Acts 20. So now, brethren, I command you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among those who are sanctified. An inheritance. Something is coming to us. Something is coming to us. All right. In Colossians 1, 12, yeah, you guys go right there, and you can go, let's just look real, real quick over to Colossians. Colossians 1.12. I'm going to read a couple, couple things out of Colossians. I'm going to read them in the end, like last week. Colossians 1.12. Everybody there? giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified and made us fit to share the portion which is the inheritance of the saints, God's holy, pe whole, God's holy people in the light. Right. <coughs> Go down to uh, chapter 2, verse 18. So it's the babies, the guy up here. Again, Amplified Classic. Let no one defraud you by acting as an empire and declaring you unworthy and disqualifying you for the prize insisting on self-abasement and worship of angels. Taking his stand on visions the claim he claims he has seen, vainly kept puffed up by his sensuous notions and inflated by his unspiritual thoughts and fleshly conceits, and not holding fast to the head from whom the entire body supplied and knitted together by means of its joints and ligaments grows with a growth that is from God. All right, go to chapter 3, verse 24. Knowing with all certainty that it is from the Lord and not from men, that you will receive the inheritance which is your real reward. The one whom you are actually serving is the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Our inheritance comes from the head who is Jesus. Jesus is the head of the body of the church, Jesus of Christ. All right? In Romans, it tells us that we're joint heirs with Jesus for all of the inheritance from God, which is the world, too. We inherit the world. Inheritance is the is the of the name we have inherited Jesus' authority. Right? We inherited his name. Mm -hmm. We also inherited his authority. How do we how did we inherit his authority? He gave it to us. He said, Ask anything in my name. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Ask anything in my name. All right, we have inherited the kingdom. Did you know that you inherited the kingdom of God? All right, let me prove it. To you. Let's go to Luke. Luke twelve. I'm going to go to 
verse 32. Says, do not fear, little flock. What was it, Luke? Luke 12, 36. Sorry. Do not fear, little flock, oh. for it is your father's good pleasure. Who's whose good pleasure? We can say God's good pleasure to give you what? The kingdom. inherited the kingdom. It's a little K. That means it's the earth. But it's still the kingdom. For, for in him dwells all the fullness. In Jesus dwells all the fullness of the Godhead. It is complete. And we are completed in him. Colossians 2, 9-12 talks about that. In Hebrews 1.14 it says we're the heirs of salvation. Not a new birth. Did you? We're heirs of salvation. The word, the Greek word now I'm probably going to mess this up a little bit. Soteria S-O-C-E-R-I-A means salvation. It de denotes a deliverance, a preservation preservation of material, temporal, deliverance from danger and apprehension. So it's deliverance from God's wrath. That's what salvation is. Used exclusively to sum up all the blessings bestowed by God on men in Christ through the Holy Spirit. That's what salvation is. So when Jesus was resurrected and we were able to believe in him we got all of this inheritance coming we inherited all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge let's go back to let's go back to Colossians Colossians uh, verse chapter 2 verse that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love. Whose heart? Our heart. And attaining to all the riches of the fullness assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ. So, wow. We're supposed to have full assurance of understanding and knowledge of the mysteries of God, both of who? God and Christ. In whom all, in, I'm sorry, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Who has all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge? God and Jesus. And who is supposed to have that understanding of those mysteries? We are. So when somebody says, well, you, you're, you don't have the knowledge of God, or you can't hear God's voice because, you know, well, he's God. That tells you you can. Well, I can't understand. It just doesn't make sense. I'm not as smart as God because he never read those verses. I'm, I'm not as smart as God, but I sure as heck can listen to the Holy Spirit. Yeah, we can tap into him. I know, I'm just, I'm just blowing up some people's bad theology today. Maybe that's just that's why YouTube froze. These in inheritance cause us to... <laughs> this, it, these inheritance that we just talked talked about 
causes us to walk worthy of the Lord. No one can take away that. We're worthy of the Lord. We have fruitfulness in every good work that we do. We have length of days. We have riches and honors, promotions and honors. We have protection. And most of all, Romans 8, 1 and 2 tells us we have absolutely no condemnation in Christ Jesus. The world cannot condemn us ever. So what do we have with this inheritance? We have the Abraham promise. Abraham's promise. You can go to Galatians 3.29, or just go, you can, you can go to um, Genesis and read about Abraham's promise. We have salvation. That's part of our inheritance. The kingdom and its treasures are ours. And most importantly, the name. Ours. The name of Jesus. That's part of our inheritance. And then finally, part of our inheritance is the earth. Don't believe me? Read Genesis, first three chapters. This earth is for the children of God and no one else. When Jesus returns and the trumpets are sounding and all of the nations hear the, the sound of Jesus returning, the earth will be ours. It won't be destroyed. All these people said, oh, we're going to have a nuclear war and Armageddon and all this other. No. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that we will be snatched up in a cloud of witnesses and evil be, will be raked off the earth completely and we'll be set back down in a perfect world with perfect spiritual understanding and perfect bodies and perfect minds in a perfect world where there's no killing of anything including animals so vegetarians are just trying to get a head start So is my hamburger. Anyway. <laughs> I hope somebody got something out of this. We're going to continue. Right. We're going to take a break next next week. Pastor Kathy's going to bring us a great word next week. Okay? But after that, we'll continue on this redemption. Okay? God's given me a few different things to talk about. I hope you guys are all getting something growing. Praise God. So, Lord, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for this time, Lord, to rest it, Lord. We thank you for who you are. We thank you, Lord, that your word is a two-edged sword cutting us deep and getting out, doing surgery on us, removing all of those strongholds out of our minds and our hearts to bring us closer to you to be able to walk with the purpose of your predestined understanding of who we are. And we thank you for this, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Does anyone want or need any kind of prayer?